Welcome to For His Glory Lifestyle. Thank you for your time as always. Today I'm going to do a Q&A. Rather, the questions have already been asked. So I'm going to answer some questions that I've actually often get when people first meet me and questions that I received since starting this YouTube channel. So hopefully anytime somebody asks a question, I can refer them back to this video. So I have the questions listed here. So I'm going to read them to make sure that I do not forget any of the 10 questions that people tend to ask me often um, upon meeting me. So one of the questions people tend to ask is what is my denomination? So they all hear me talk or give information about uh, time in Asia doing missions and They'll, you know, obviously ask a couple of questions about the countries that I've been in, but they'll say, um, hey, what, what's your denomination? And I tend to respond with, well, why do you ask? Because some people say you, you're Baptist because you're always, you know, with the word, everything you're saying is Bible. And I'm like, okay. And then other people are say, will say, you know, you're definitely Pentecostal, charismatic. I've gotten the gamut. I've gotten Methodist. I've gotten, I've never gotten, well, I won't say the other denominations, but my response to them is, can you show me a denomination in the Bible? Just one, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal. Well, obviously there's Pentecost, right? In the book of Acts. But when you look through Genesis to Revelation, can you find me a denomination that Jesus said that we are to start because a denomination is a sect right? It is when you think of, uh, for example, dollars or whatever the currency is for your country, there is a $1 bill, $5 bill, $10 bill. Those are, cons those are called denominations, right? A set. So a meeting for denomination, the denomination is a particular religious group, which has slightly different beliefs from other groups within the same faith, which is not scriptural. So when people ask me, I say I'm Genesis to Revelation. And while thinking about this question for this broadcast, I forgot how many denominations as it relates to Christianity are there in the world. So according to, let's see, it's the study of global Christianity. There are more than 200 Christian denominations in the United States. And are you, wait, wait for it, are you ready? 45,000 globally. And again, this is according to the Center for the Study of Global Christianity. <sighs> Can we read John 4, 17, please? 14, yes, but John 17. John 17, 20, Jesus praying for us all, right? For the sensationalist who says Jesus is not talking about all the believers to come. But he says, my prayer is not for them alone, meaning his disciples. I pray for all those who will believe in me through their message. So anyone who believes in the gospel of the kingdom of God, this is who Jesus is praying for. Verse 21, he says that all of them may be one, right? All of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, which is a whole nother conversation in itself, right? That they may be one as we are one. But then 23, here it is. I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. So how is having 200 or 45,000 denominations within the Christian faith, unity. Okay, but anyway, at the end of 23, it says, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So this whole thing of different denominations and people physically getting into altercations because you stand with the Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, again, None of those, there's no name denomination in the Bible. So I'll just leave it at that. So the answer to that question, what is my denomination? It's Genesis Revelation, not Genesis through Revelation, Genesis Revelation. Okay, next question. What is your favorite books of the Bible? Um, well, I, it's, how do I answer this question? Genesis to Revelation, those are my favorite books. But when I think of, I tend to answer questions 
associated with threes, right? Because God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So if I was to choose three books of the Bible um, to say that are my favorite, but even saying that makes me uncomfortable because we're to, supposed to meditate on the entire word of God, right? Um, but Genesis, John, and Revelation. Why? Genesis is obviously the beginning, right? Beginning for human beings, not Isaiah 14, where we're talking about the fall of Satan, which is before the beginning of time or beginning, excuse me, of in Genesis one, in the beginning was the word, right? Well, sorry, John one, I'm getting ahead of myself. So Genesis, because obviously we have an introduction of human beings, Adam and Eve walking in the garden with the Lord and the Lord God walking with them, obviously the fall. So everything starts there. And then John, we have God himself wrapped in flesh. Jesus, Jesus came, yes? And redemption, everything that Genesis talks about in Genesis 3, we see manifested in John. And then of course, Revelation, which I don't understand why people don't read Revelation. When I first got saved, I would hear people say, oh, don't read Revelation. You're not ready for it. It's, you know, it's kind of scary. I don't understand how it's scary because it talks about Jesus's return, Jesus returning and everybody who's in Jesus, who've been found faithful, right? We'll talk about that another time, but who, who's been found faithful will welcome his return and be uh, with him in eternity, with God, in the new Jerusalem. So those are the three, um, my three favorites. Question number three, why are you always talking about salvation? I get this from Christians, or rather self-proclaiming Christians. Non-Christians, I've never been asked this question before, because when I've been in other countries and we're dealing with witches and warlocks here in the States, New Agers, right? That's a whole nother story. Um, I always tell them that I have an agenda and the agenda is to do what God has left me and other born again individuals, his children in the world for, which is to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God so people don't go to hell. That's another question. Why do I talk about hell so much? But we'll get to that in a minute. So the reason I talk about salvation is that there is nothing else more important outside obviously of your family, our husbands, our wives, our children, then salvation, proclaiming that Jesus Christ, yes, everybody knows 316 came to the world to save the world, not to condemn it, but to save individual people, not your animals, not your dogs and your cats, but people who are made in the image of God, he came to save us. So when we become born again, he does not all of a sudden rapture us up. He has left us here with the mandate, which is to proclaim that number one, Jesus Christ is Lord, but to those who need to understand that they need to repent and turn from sin. And we'll talk about why I talk about sin as well, because that's another question. So yes, yeah, so why do I talk about salvation? Let's look at uh, Luke 19 and 10, where it says, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. So if the son of man is now residing in the mortal bodies of believers, when I say believers, born again, people who love Jesus Christ, if he came to seek and save the lost, why are we not looking to seek the lost or looking for the lost or engaging with people who are lost so they can know that they can be saved from eternal damnation? And eternal damnation is saying no to God and spending eternity away from him in hell, suffering, okay? So now uh, two more verses that I thought to mention as it relates to this question. Uh, Mark 13, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. That's when the end will come. Matthew 24 and 14, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. So notice it doesn't say when everybody becomes believers, when everybody becomes saved, born again, sanctified, it doesn't say that. We are here in the earth realm, again, born again believers, not self-proclaimed Christians, not self-proclaimed believers, born again, born anew, right? To preach the gospel of the kingdom. It doesn't say tell our testimony. It says, preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Yes, there are scriptures that say we overcome the enemy, we overcome the devil, we overcome evil by the blood of the lamb and a word of testimony. 
And we love the, not our life to death, unto death, right? But we are to preach the gospel. It doesn't say share the gospel. It doesn't say show the gospel. That thing that I heard in the West upon returning of, you know, don't preach the gospel, just um, share your testimony. The scripture doesn't say that. Uh, don't preach, don't, don't say a lot, just show them the gospel. The scriptures don't say that either. It says to preach, proclaim, declare goodness, All right? So we get to the next question. Why are you always talking about hell? Hmm. Yeah, the, these are real questions, people. Okay, so I'm going to read this and then I'll, I'll, res I'll respond the way I should respond. But anyway, the Bible continuously, continually one of a place called hell. There are over 162 references in the New Testament alone, which warns of hell, and over 70 of those references were uttered by the Lord Jesus. <sighs> and the King James Bible, for those King James only Bible readers, the Old Testament term Sheol is translated as hell 31 times, and it is translated as the grave, not just the grave in a graveyard or a cemetery. Um, Sheol is also translated as the, as the pit three times. So we're not going to get into a discussion of hell. I'll do a video on the different, um, on what scripture means or what the scriptures talk about as relates to hell, Sheol, the pit, eternal fire. The reason to talk about hell is that you cannot talk about the kingdom of God and people needing to repent from sin and turn to Jesus Christ without telling them about hell. Because here's the thing, if you do not tell people, warn people that there is a place called hell that they will be in eternity away from God, then how are you preaching the gospel of the kingdom? You can't preach, yes, heaven, eternal self, um, eternal life in the new Jerusalem. And by the way, scripture does say that heaven and earth will pass away, right? So again, another conversation. I know I say it a lot in videos, but I, I really try to keep these or make an attempt to keep these videos short, shorter than an hour. But you cannot talk about everlasting life with God without talking about everlasting life without God, which is eternal fire. And again, I don't know where this idea that hell doesn't exist anymore comes from. Well, no, I do know where it comes from. It comes from the pit of hell, but people need to be warned that there is eternity without God. But here's the thing, you cannot preach the gospel and give people more information about hell so they'll be afraid to go to hell so they'll become a Christian. They need to encounter Jesus Christ, receive him, encounter him, meaning believe in Jesus Christ, receive him as it's discussed in John 1, so that they can receive Jesus, not just a ticket out of hell. And that ticket out of hell mindset is, okay, I'm not going to hell, so I'm saved, or I don't want to go to hell, therefore I'm saved. That is not salvation. Having a revelation that there is eternal damnation and you can spend eternity in hell, but there's a savior who kept you from the wrath of God, right? That's what you receive, Jesus Christ. And because of your receiving of Jesus Christ that keeps you out of hell, then that is salvation. Not, I have a ticket, I don't want to go to hell, so therefore I'm saved. Because when you explain hell to people, no one wants to go there, obviously, if they're completely lost and demonized, but no one wants to go to hell. So most people who think they're saved say, because I don't want to go to hell, because I don't want to be in eternal fire, then I'll believe in Jesus Christ. But that doesn't make them saved. That makes them logical and reasonable. That's like saying, do you want to spend eternity in pain? No one wants to spend, spend five minutes in pain. Again, if you cycle, you do. But that's not a basis for salvation, right? So let's, let's just let's keep on moving. Sin, question number five. Why are you always talking about sin? I'm just going to close. I have a physical Bible here, right? No, I'm going to open it. Okay, so I'm going to read what I wrote first. Christian 
theology. So some, depending on where you're from, um, I studied in England, studied in Spain. So the translation, not the translate, the, the, the pronunciation. So hamish, hamishology or hamatology, it is the branch of Christian theology, which is the study of sin, describes sin as the act of offense against God by despising his person and Christian biblical law and by injuring others. So why do I talk about sin? Number one, it appears that the church, or excuse me, there are individuals in the West who do not talk about sin. I have listened to messages, thousands of messages, right? Thousands have been saved over decades. So thousands of messages where I can listen to three, four months of a particular church's and a minister's messages and do not hear them preach about sin. Think about it. Jesus Christ, God himself came as the son of man, came to be to, to be killed, right? Because the Bible says that God, it, it pleased God to crucify Jesus. That's a whole nother, again, Bible study. But Jesus died for sin. Jesus died in order for human beings to not, number one, have to live in sin and do not have to be judged because of sin. And I will keep saying sin because people keep singing about preachers or preach about it, mistakes. A mistake is, oops, I dropped something. Sin is a, I know what God says to do, and I have made a willing choice not to do it. That is sin, and that is what Jesus Christ died for. So can you people stop saying, well, God loves you when you make mistakes? It's not mistakes that Jesus Christ was whipped and crucified for. Jesus Christ was crucified, right? Crucified for sin. That's one part of it. But for us to have the power to overcome sin, right? So it's not mistakes. It's not oopsies. It's sin, an offense towards God. When we sin towards others, when we do things that are antithetical to how Christ calls us to live, it is called sin. Can born again believers sin? Yes. But the scriptures say, if you sin, not when you sin, it says, if you sin, meaning you still have a choice, right? Your physical body can still engage in activities that you can engage in prior to be born again. But when you're born again, you're, you, you don't want to do anything that's an offense to God, right? I almost said the Lord, he's Lord. If you are born again and you said yes to his Lordship over your life. But again, I'm trying to keep this video short. So I'm just answering the, the, the 10 questions. Um, question number six, why are you always say self-proclaimed? Okay, so this is where we're going to go to John 1, 13. So I'm going to go to the scriptures and I want you to do the same after this video. Again, pause and get your Bible so you can read for yourself. John 1, 9 through, actually all of John, period, but specifically John 1, 9 through 13, where it says, and I'm going to read three different versions, okay? I'm going to read the NIV, the New King James, and the Amplified, for those who just did the, you know, the scratching thing for the NIV and the New and the Amplified, you'll be fine. Okay, so 9, verse 9, the true light gives light to everyone who's coming into the world, right? That means there is a false light. The Bible says that Satan clothes himself, depending on your translation, or comes as a false light and he has false servants. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, but we'll again talk about that in a different another time. Verse 10, he was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Again, his own did not receive him. You have to receive Jesus Christ. Okay, yet to all who did receive him, to those he, the, those who believed in him, his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I talked about this in the video uh, uh, called Children of God, Children of the Devil. I need to move this mic. Children of God, children of the devil. But here's verse 13. 
children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God, okay? New King James Version, verse 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, yes? Meaning you didn't make the decision. Your papa, father, mother, grandparents didn't make the decision. They didn't say you were Christian. You were born of God, okay? Now get to the self-proclaiming Christian part. The amplified version, going version, going down to verse 13. Who were born not of blood, which is natural conception. Again, in Asia, this whole I was born saved or I was always a Christian, which is people in the West say, no. His born, excuse me, verse 13, who were born not of blood, natural conception, nor of the will of the flesh, a physical impulse. So the Bible says you were dead, dead in sin. You are darkness. So how does a dead person make a decision when you're dead, right? So I don't know how it actually works. How does believing in Jesus Christ, you believe because you were convicted by the Holy Spirit. You don't make a decision, right? You don't just say, okay, I believe in Jesus Christ without actually being convicted by the Holy Spirit and receiving Jesus. How does that physically work? I have no idea. I have never met a born again believer when we all sit down and say, okay, explain in detail, step-by-step step what happened. We can explain, yes, we were sitting in our homes or sitting on a plane. There was other people who were sitting in the crack house, getting ready to smoke crack. People had guns to their heads, getting ready to blow their heads out. And all of a sudden they saw, heard, felt, had revelation that Jesus Christ, son of God, God himself, Holy Spirit was real and they received him. And so they had this encounter. They had this revelation. So it wasn't like, oh, okay, you know, I'm smoking pipe and yeah, I believe Jesus Christ is real or I'm smoking weed or whatever it is. And oh yes, Jesus Christ is real because you know what? I don't want to go to hell. No, they had an encounter because they were born again of God. Not, oh, your parents grew up, you grew up in a household that was Christian or your parents was taking you to church since you were in your mother's womb. So when you were born, you were born while your parents were going to church. That doesn't make you a Christian, right? And so again, I've said it multiple times and I'll keep saying it. People see, you know, someone on TV and they're like, oh, I believe that person. And they had, you know, felt the goosebumps. You know, you feel goosebumps when someone hits a high note when they sing. You feel goosebumps when you're cold, but that does not mean that you are a born again Christian. And then verse 13 finishes with, and excuse me, it says, nor of the will of man that a natural father, but of God. So not of physical flesh, physical impulses, nor the will of man, that of a natural father, but of God. That's a divine and supernatural birth. They are born of God, spiritually transformed, renewed and sanctified. So why do I keep saying self-proclaiming Christians? You are a self-proclaiming Christian. If you say, oh yes, I'm a Christian, but, but what? But sometimes I don't know if God is real. Okay, you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian. Oh, I don't know. You know, I don't know if God is good. You're not a Christian because God is good. Everything he created, he said was good. Oh, I, I don't know. You know, I, I still like, um, like having sex with my boyfriend or girlfriend and God understands my heart. You're not a Christian. You are not born again because if you're born again, you do not habitually sin. That is why I say self-proclaiming Christians. Moving on to next question. Seven, do you, don't you think it's the pastor's or minister's fault that Christians are the way they are in the West? I'm going to say that, read that question again. Don't you think it's the pastor's or minister's fault that Christians are the way they are in the West? So I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Number one, when you became born again to the born again person, and when you became a self-proclaiming Christian, 
to the self-proclaiming Christian person. Did you make that decision by yourself or was there a pastor or minister with you? And if there was a pastor or minister with you, did they make the decision for you? And if they made the decision for you, then you would say it is their fault that you are the way you are. But if you had an encounter with Jesus Christ, even if it was someone who was ministering the gospel, preaching the gospel to you, you had that encounter on your own, right? Now, yes, the Bible gives us apostles, prophets, teach, uh, uh, yes, apostles, prophets, again, to all of those who will be itching, which is that religious spirit, but we'll talk about that later, teachers and pastors and preachers and ministers and evangelists, what? To do the work of the ministry, right? They are teachers of the gospel. They're pastors of the gospel. But there are multiple scriptures that says you study to show yourself approved. You work out your own soul salvation. You meditate on the word day and night. You have the scriptures written on your forehead and in your heart. You were filled supposedly with the Holy Spirit. You are the one that's supposed to put on the clothes of righteousness. So can you please stop blaming pastors and ministers, apostles, prophets, may they be false or may they just have gotten it wrong because they are still learning and reading and studying scriptures, blaming them for your state of rebellion against the word of God. They are not the ones when you stand before Jesus Christ in that Bema seat or rather that judgment seat and you say, oh, I didn't know that I had to stop sleeping with my boyfriend because the pastor told me it was okay because the pastor was sleeping with people in the church. Mm, yeah. You cannot blame pastors and ministers and teachers of the gospel. They will have to give an account for leading people astray. But how is it that the Holy Spirit who brought you alive, who brought you from death, didn't tell you that what they were saying was wrong? For those who, for example, who did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that will mean that you didn't study the scriptures. That will mean that the Holy Spirit that supposedly came into you when you were born again, who sealed you in God, you're going to have to question. You're going to have to question, did you really become a Christian? When you said, oh, I'm a Christian because you wept and cried when you were 10 years old. And then you never studied the scripture or when you read this book, you read this book and you did not see it as the living word of God. There are so many people who are sitting in churches today who believe that they are Christians, but don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit or don't believe in the Holy Spirit at all. They believe in the word, but not the spirit of the word. They believe in the law, but not the fact that Jesus Christ poured out his spirit on into the world. When the Bible says Jesus came into the world to save the world, my question is, how is he still saving the world if he's already gone? And there's no Holy Spirit to convict people of sin. Can someone answer that for me, my sensationalist, non-believing in the Holy Spirit, the signs, wonders, miracles, healing, speaking in tongues, self-proclaiming Christians? Help me understand that. Here's a, couple of, uh, here's a couple of scriptures as it relates to people blaming pastors and ministers for their state of sin. 2 Timothy 2.14, remind the believers, yes? Remind the believers of these things, charging them before God to avoid quarreling over words, which succeed only in leading the listener to ruin. Verse 15, make every effort to present yourself. It doesn't say have the class to present you. Present yourself approved to God, not approved to other people, not approved to pastors, approved to God, an unashamed workman who accurate, actu accurately handled the word of truth. 16, but avoid irrelevant empty chatter, which will only lead to more ungodliness. This whole back and forth of arguing, you know, what certain scriptures should you be baptized in the Son, the, the God, the Son, and Holy Spirit, or just the name of Jesus, just <laughs> Joshua 1 and 8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, not the pastor, preacher, teacher's mouth, your mouth, but you shall meditate it on day and not night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written. 
in it for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success, not just prosperous with things, okay? Prosperous and successful, walking pleasing with Jesus Christ, walking with the Holy Spirit, right? Listening to God. Yes, God does still speak. I don't understand how people believe that God doesn't speak anymore. When I first got saved and I was telling pastors in particular denominations that yes, I'm hearing the Lord and God is telling me to go and preach the gospel on street corners and give money or buy groceries and doing all these things. They were like, no, 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 God doesn't speak. That That's all we need to pray for you because that's you know something from your past. I'm like, okay, but then how do you obey God if you're not hearing him? Well, you just need to read the word. Okay, but the Bible says be led by the Holy Spirit. So how is the Holy Spirit leading you if you're not hearing, seeing, feeling, having unctions of the Holy Spirit telling you to do things? But okay, I digress. Those are questions that you can answer and you can leave those your answers in the comments. Okay, next question. Question number eight, more of a, uh, well, not quite personal question, but the question is how long were you overseas doing ministry? How long have you been a missionary? So how long have I traveled overseas to do ministry? I started traveling, um, I was born again in 2004. I was sent to Nigeria in 2005. So I had been doing ministry overseas since 2005. How long was I based in uh, South Korea as a missionary? I was based there, but was being sent out to other Asian nations and other African nations since 2009. So six months out of the year, I would teach. I actually have a PhD in information tech organizational behavior, specializing in IT. So I would teach six months out of the year uh, at universities, uh, help develop courses as well for universities in Asia, as well as here in the United States. And then the other five to six months out of the year, traveling with teams, we're teaching, preaching, and not just preaching and teaching the gospel, but building hospital schools, um, mixing cement with, with shovels, wading through water, thought about the snakes later, but yeah, just doing what God calls everyone to do, which is to go out and preach the gospel to all the nations. Um, some people, all the nations is next door. All the nations is your company. All the nations is your family, but you are to go out and, and share the gospel. So since 2005, uh, uh, how long? Oh, yes. Yeah. So next question, which country were you in? I asked that question. I was based in South Korea, but again, I, I was living there, had residency there, and traveling out to different parts of Asia, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Philippines, none of these countries multiple times, uh, Thailand, and the type of ministry you're doing, minister to men who were sex trafficking women and children, and also ministering to those who were being trafficked. We also ministered a lot to those who were being persecuted. And when we say persecuted, we're not talking about the gossip or the YouTube video slandering you that's here in the West. We're talking about people whose houses, churches, um, homes were burnt down or destroyed, bulldozed, and individuals who were hiding out because their family members were getting their heads cut off or raped. So we were ministering to those who survived persecution, as well as minister to those who were being encouraged to continue on being persecuted for the gospel. So that's the answer to question number nine. And question number 10, uh, I've, I would normally would say I've traveled over to 40, over 40 countries, but because of this question, I looked through my passport and have a list and it is, I've ministered in, or rather ministered, traveled to, taught in, lived in 42 different nations. Thank you, Jesus. Um, people often ask which has been my favorite country. And then I have to ask for some context because when they ask the favorite country to minister in, favorite country to live in, favorite country, but in general, my, my favorite country is the United States. Why the United States? Um, multiple reasons, not only because I'm American, I was born here, raised here, was born again on an airplane coming back here, 
but I love the United States. Why do I love the United States? Because you have the world, individuals from nations all over the world here that you can minister to, preach, teach, share, not share, preach the gospel to, and they go back to their nation. So you're not on that flight 36, 42 hours to get to that nation, even though there's nothing wrong with that. And thank you, God, for all the times that the, the plane got to the destination safely, but the United States. Why? Again, it, it's number one, it feels like home, even though when I was in Korea, it felt like home. When I was in other nations, it always feels like home because for me, home is in the perfect will of God. And if that perfect will is in uh, the jungles of a particular nation or in the most expensive hotel, I was going to say the hotel, the hotel, but I'm not going to do that. Hotels in England or here in the United States, wherever God will have me in his perfect will, that's where I feel at home. That's where I'm home. But as it relates to my favorite nation, I'll again say the United States. And for those who are anti-America, let me just throw this in for you. Can you name one country where they have their citizens collect taxes from their citizens and send them to the United States? Just name one. Can you name a country that has the most number of illegal persons, I won't say immigrants, illegal persons who have the same benefits, medical, education, and sometimes even more so, of the citizens of that nation compared to the United States. You can't name one. Name another country that has the constitution that the United States has, as well as the Bill of Rights and laws that protect their citizens the way the United States does, including protecting those who are illegal persons in the United States and those who commit crimes in the United States. Name one. So there, 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 there are three criterias for me, for you to answer the question as to why a particular country is your favorite and why I think the United States is, yes, the greatest country it currently and to ever exist. Now, does the United States, the people in the United States need Jesus? Yes. And that is why I am decreeing, declaring that every single person who watches this video, if you're based in the United States, may you repent and give your life to Jesus for real and not have your love for United States or political party in the United States as your God, not even the constitution as your God. You didn't even see that coming, did y'all? Y'all didn't see that coming. Yes. And every single person around the world, especially those who I know personally in those nations that are watching these videos, may you again, repent, submit, repent to Jesus, turn to Jesus, receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit so you can repent and turn to Jesus. Everyone, again, thank you for your time. Any comments, good or bad, leave them in the comments and I'll see you next time. Bye.